The Story of Cetaceans What springs to mind when you think of a whale? Blubber, blowholes, and flukes are among the hallmarks of the roughly 80 species of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises alive today. But because they're mammals, we know that they must have evolved from land-dwelling ancestors. About 375 million years ago, the first tetrapods, vertebrates with arms and legs, pushed themselves out of the swamps and began to live on land. This major evolutionary transition set the stage for all subsequent groups of land-dwelling vertebrates, including a diverse lineage called synapsids, which originated about 306 million years ago. Though these creatures such as Dimetrodon looked like reptiles, they were actually the archaic precursors of mammals. By the time the first mammals evolved 200 million years ago, however, dinosaurs were the dominant vertebrates. Mammals diversified in the shadow of the great archosaurs and they remained fairly small and secretive until the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out by a mass extinction 65 million years ago. This global catastrophe cleared the way for a major radiation of mammals. It was only about 10 million years after this extinction and more than 250 million years since the earliest tetrapods crawled out onto land that the first whales evolved. These earliest cetaceans were not like the whales we know today and only recently have paleontologists been able to recognize them. For more than a century, our knowledge of the whale fossil record was so sparse that no one could be certain what the ancestors of whales looked like. Now the tide has turned. In the space of just three decades, a flood of new fossils has filled in the gaps in our knowledge to turn the origin of whales into one of the best documented examples of large-scale evolutionary change in the fossil record. These ancestral creatures were stranger than anyone ever expected. There was no straight-line march of terrestrial mammals leading up to fully aquatic whales, but an evolutionary riot of amphibious cetaceans that walked and swam along rivers, estuaries, and the coasts of prehistoric Asia. As strange as modern whales are, their fossil predecessors were even stranger. Pioneers who cleared land in Alabama and Arkansas frequently found enormous round bones. Some settlers used them as fireplace hurts, others popped up fences with the bones or used them as cornerstones, slaves used the bones as pillows. The bones were so numerous that in some fields they were destroyed because they interfered with cultivating the land. In 1832, a hill collapsed on the Arkansas property of Judge H. Bry and exposed a long sequence of 28 of the circular bones. He thought they might be of scientific interest and sent a package to the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. No one quite knew what to make of them. Some of the sediment attached to the bone contained small shells that showed that the large creature had once lived in an ancient sea, but little more could be said with any certainty. Harlan thought the bones were most similar to those of extinct marine reptiles, such as the long-necked plesiosaurs and streamlined ichthyosaurs. He tentatively assigned it the name Basilosaurus. He wasn't certain, though. The jaw contained teeth that differed in size and shape and a characteristic of mammals but not most reptiles. Why did the largest fossil reptile that ever lived have mammal-like teeth? Harlan traveled to London in 1839 to present Basilosaurus to some of the leading paleontologists and anatomists of the day. Richard Owen, a rising star in the academic community, carefully scrutinized every bone and he even received permission to slice into the teeth to study their microscopic structure. His attention to such tiny details ultimately settled the identification of the sea monster. Basilosaurus did share some traits with some marine reptiles, but this was only a superficial case of convergence of animals in the same habitat evolving similar traits because both types of creatures had lived in the sea. The overall constellation of traits, including double-rooted teeth, unquestionably identified Basilosaurus as a mammal. After inspecting vertebrae and other fragments found in Alabama, Richard Harlan of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia thought the bones were most similar to those of extinct marine reptiles. He tentatively assigned it the name Basilosaurus. Pictured is a 3D model of a Basilosaurus. A few years later, a scientist handling a different specimen with his colleagues pulled out a bone from the skull, dropped it, and it shattered on the floor. When the unnerved scientists gathered the fragments, they noticed that the bone now revealed the inner ear. 
there was only one other kind of creature with an inner ear that matched, a whale. Not long after the true identity of Basilosaurus was resolved, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection raised questions about how whales evolved. The fossil record was so sparse that no definite determination could be made, but in a thought experiment included in On the Origin of Species, Darwin speculated about how natural selection might create a whale-like creature over time. From Land to Sea Whales belong to the order Ceterodactylae, like pigs, deer, camels, and hippopotamuses. This might sound like strange fellows for a seafaring mammal. Considering their origins, however, it isn't that weird. In fact, the first known cetacean in the fossil record doesn't look like a whale at all. Meet Pachycetus, aka the whale of Pakistan. Scientists have identified a number of interesting structures that indicate Pachycetus is the first cetacean. Its leg bones are denser than you would expect for a land mammal, suggesting that they acted as a ballast while in the water. Its eyes are also placed unusually high on its head, like an animal that can peek above the water while submerged. Most indicative of all, however, are structures in its inner ear that would have helped it to hear underwater, and only whales have this structure today. This is where the story of whales begins with an amphibious mammal no larger than a dog. Over the next 15 million years, descendants of the line of Pachycetus became more and more aquatic, with their limbs slowly transforming into flippers. Eventually, sometime between 30 and 35 million years before today, basal baleen whales Mysticetes first appeared and this is where our focus for giant whales lies. Bigger and bigger. Here is where it gets wrinkly. Whales haven't always been as massive as they are today. Prehistoric whales averaged about 20 feet long or just above 6 meters. Today's whales are, on average, more than twice as large. Of the 14 species of baleen whale that live today, only 2 or 3 are 20 to 30 feet long. Somewhere between 35 million years ago and now, Whales exploded in size as a group. Whale biologists have thought of many potential reasons why this happened. For one thing, in evolution, a group of animals that survives and evolves for a long time tends to get larger and larger over that period. While it doesn't happen with every group, it's such a common theme that evolutionary biologists have called it Cope's Rule after the famed paleontologist Edward Cope, who often saw patterns like these happen over evolutionary time. Other reasons that animals get large are as a response to predators. Big individuals tend to avoid predation more easily than smaller ones. In some cases, animals grow large as a response to colder temperatures since big individuals keep in heat more easily than smaller ones. It's also reasonable to think that animals might grow large as a response to competition from other animals. Big individuals can compete better against smaller ones. So which one makes the most sense for whales? Diet a whale's diet consists mainly of small fish, krill, and plankton. Krill are tiny crustaceans that live in the ocean's surface waters and are a primary food source for many types of marine life, including whales. Plankton are even tinier microorganisms that drift in the sea and are also an important part of the food chain. To eat all this tiny prey, a whale must do some serious filter feeding. The whale opens its huge mouth wide and swallows vast quantities of water along with anything else that happens to be floating around in there, like krill, plankton, and small fish. Then it forces the water back out through its baleen plates. These are long, hair-like, keratinous fibers that hang down from the roof of the mouth and act like a giant filter, trapping the food while allowing the water to escape. The whale then swallows its meal whole, bones, scales, and all. Bigger is better? When Geerty and colleagues created a series of computer models analyzing factors that influence size, they found two that converged to determine body size in aquatic mammals. The first is that these mammals need to be large to trap enough body heat. Larger mammals also lose less of this heat to the surrounding water, which gives them a major advantage over their smaller counterparts, according to the models published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. But larger animals need more food to support their bulk, which created the second factor in Geerty's model. Big mammals may trap heat better, but if they can't get enough food to fuel their metabolism, then it doesn't matter. Body size is one of the most important traits to study in animals. According to Chris Van Ditty, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Reading in England who wasn't involved in the new study. Patches of food 
The recent research by Graham Slater, Jeremy Goldbogen, and Nicholas Pineson analyzed dozens of baleen whale fossils. They observed their evolutionary history and combined their observations with oceanographical knowledge and mathematical models to figure out if there was a sudden change in baleen whale body size, as well as when it happened. Overall, the data showed that between 35 and 3 million years ago, a whale's average body size varied somewhat randomly, with some individuals growing larger and some growing smaller based on local ecology and their own genes. However, 3 million years ago, the trend of change started moving towards larger body sizes for nearly all groups. In other words, the somewhat random process of changing body size in baleen whales suddenly gained a direction, and that direction was up. The researchers also found that the timing of that evolution corresponded to a big change in the distribution of food worldwide. Around the time the baleen whales started to become gigantic, upwelling of deep, nutrient-rich water became much stronger along the coastlines of the world. That boost in coastal nutrients meant more photosynthetic algae and in turn, some animals like krill, herring and sardines became much more concentrated there. For whales, that's a lot of places where food is very dense, but each patch is a long distance from the next one. This story fits well with our knowledge of how these giants take advantage of resources. Today's baleen whales are often migratory, taking long trips between patches of food, then sticking around to eat from the rich buffet as long as possible before moving on to the next one. This also may explain why different groups of baleen whales all grew to massive size independently. After all, a blue whale can gulp down over half a million calories in a single lunge. That's an efficient way to eat for a giant. Final thoughts. The history of whales is a fascinating one, and we should all appreciate these majestic creatures. They have come a long way from their land-dwelling ancestors to the ocean-faring animals they are today. We need to continue to learn more about them in order to protect them and ensure their future in our oceans. Leave a comment and let us know your favorite fact about whales.